Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. The website is aroundtheempire.com. This is listener-supported independent media. Please pitch in if you can, patreon.com slash aroundtheempire or paypal.me slash aroundtheempirepod. Follow us on Twitter at Around the Empire, and please help me build up the YouTube channel by subscribing. That's free, youtube.com slash aroundtheempire. Today, we're talking with journalist and author Daniel Lazar. We discuss some key questions that we have about the Mueller report and surprising things that the Mueller report doesn't even cover at all. In Lazar's own words, quote, Mueller's doorstopper of a report may be chock full of facts, but it's also filled with non sequiturs, loose threads, and self-serving arguments that we've come to expect from official Washington. It's good on collusion, pointing out that reports of a Trump-Russia conspiracy remain unsubstantiated, despite desperate Democratic efforts to spin it otherwise. But it's lousy on interference, regurgitating the standard intelligence community line that Russia, quote, interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion, unquote. Simultaneously, it's remarkably incurious about how the scandal began, who propelled it along, and how it all snowballed into a mega Watergate, unquote. Daniel Lazar is a journalist, author of three books, The Frozen Republic, The Velvet Coup, and America's Undeclared War. He writes at Consortium News and at his website, daniellazar.com. We recorded this on May 8th, 2019. Daniel Lazar is speaking to us from New York. Hello, Dan. Welcome to Around the Empire. Uh, thanks for having me. So, Dan, you've written four articles recently on Consortium News on the topic of Russiagate. And the most recent one is on May, from May 6th, Top 10 Questions About the Mueller Report. So I think it makes sense for us to talk about that one today. And if we have enough time, maybe we can touch on the, uh, the review that you did of the Papadopoulos book which I also, I'm in the process of reading. I've not finished it yet, but I'm curious about your, your thoughts on that. But from the May 6th, and, and overall, what we had agreed to talk about, uh, Dan and I, was the, you know, the origins of Russiagate. Because that seems to be where this is going, at least what interests me a lot. And from your May 6th article, I saw on Facebook, there's a quote from it. It says, the Mueller report is an exercise in disinformation. It generates more questions than answers about what may well have been an effort to sabotage U.S.-Russian relations and cripple the White House. That's a strong statement. You want to say anything more about that? I, gen- I generally agree with it, by the way. Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, let's, let's do a quick uh, historical recap. Uh, let's go back to 2014, uh, early 2014, where uh, things on the foreign policy front were really falling apart in a big way for the Obama administration. Um, you had the, uh, the Maidan riots in, uh, in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, which in late February led to a revolution in which uh, the, the existing president, uh, uh, Yanukovych, uh, fled to Russia, and uh, he was replaced by a new president, Poroshenko, but simultaneously... Um, uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, retaliated by uh, seizing the Crimea, uh, a, a peninsula under Ukrainian, Ukrainian control, but which has a, uh, Russia's major naval base in the Black Sea. And then, um, then things started falling apart in a big way in Syria as well, where um, al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, which received kind of quasi-semi sort of U.S. backing, via Saudi Arabia and the UAE, was essentially advancing on the Bashar al-Assad regime and looked like it actually may at one point have caused the regime to fall. Um, and so you had two responses. And so, and so the, and the U.S. policy in Syria was extremely confused. It didn't want al-Qaeda to advance, but it somehow wanted Bashar al-Assad to step down. So it wanted Assad to step down without al-Qaeda advancing, which was really impossible. Yeah. So, so essentially, um, Putin cut the Gordian knot by, um, by number one, seizing Crimea uh, in March uh, uh, 2014. And then in November 
uh, I think it's November 2015, um, or September 2015. Yeah, September 30th, uh, I think. Yeah, sending in warplanes uh, to Syria in support of the Assad regime, to stabilize the Assad regime and prevent an al-Qaeda ISIS takeover. Now, I, I personally think that, that, that Putin's actions were quite understandable if not even justified under the circumstances. But the U.S. became deeply furious, alarmed, even panicked over this, uh, his really rather adept counter-movers, counter-maneuvers. Uh, um, and, uh, and as a result, uh, fury mounted in Washington against Russia in general and Putin in particular. And this fury was especially pronounced among neocons, especially the, 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 the Clinton wing of the Democrats, uh, the classic neocons who were always, uh, essentially, the war party in Washington. Would you, um, would you, count, would you count John Brennan in that crew? Oh, of, of course. The, the intelligence agencies were all fiercely anti-Russian, fiercely alarmed. So when Donald Trump you know, mounted his campaign, presidential campaign, in the summer of 2015 and started essentially making sort of nice understanding noises toward Russia, um, this, this pro-war camp, this deeply anti-Russian camp, um, reacted with fury and alarm. Yeah. And the anger kept mounting and mounting and mounting, and the only explanation that this faction could, could come up with to explain Trump's criticisms were that he was somehow in league with Putin, somehow, you know, had entered in some kind of nefarious undercover alliance, et cetera, et cetera. He somehow was Putin's bitch, Putin's puppet, you know. And, uh, and, um, and that was the only explanation, because they couldn't understand why anyone would find fault with U.S. policies, even though they were completely disastrous. Or how they would dare, uh, how they would dare to challenge, yes. Yeah, and I must say that you know, Trump's challenge uh, really amounted to one of the strongest challenges of U.S. foreign policy by a, um, uh, a, pres a major presidential candidate in post-war history. In some ways, it really even exceeded anything that, that Bernie Sanders would say. So the, um, the Hillary camp was up in arms. The intelligence agencies were up in arms. The media, led by the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, et cetera, et cetera, were up in arms. And so therefore, they were quick to label uh, Trump as Putin's puppet. And that was actually the phrase that, that Hillary Clinton used in one of the debates in 2016. Would you, would you say that I just read in, on Pat Lang's blog recently, uh, Larry Johnson's been writing about this. And his premise is that that was their operating theory from 2015. You know, was that was that Trump must be in league with with the Russians, you know, because he because he favored detente at the time. Yes. And the Guardian, the uh, the the London Guardian printed an article uh, early in uh, in 2017, I believe, saying that by late 2015, 2015, there was a lot of chatter among intelligence agencies uh, in Estonia, uh, um, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, et cetera, about, um, about strange Trump-Russian contacts. Uh, and this chatter eventually reached the British, who eventually told the Americans. Um, and essentially, it seems that some kind of counterintelligence campaign was launched well before the FBI uh, launched its formal criminal investigation known as uh, as Crossfire Hurricane. Right. So Yeah, it sure looks that way. Anyway, with these informants being inserted into the campaign and yeah, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so you, so we have this uh, so in, in 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 early March 2016, uh this young guy George Papadopoulos uh who was was named a a foreign policy advisor to Trump. And the only reason he was named a foreign policy advisor to Trump is that Trump was shooting his mouth off and seemed to have no idea what he was talking about and therefore needed, needed a bunch of, quote, advisors to give, you know, give the idea of, you know, some notion of solemnity and, and weight. Um, and, uh, and as soon as word got out in early March that Papadopoulos was a foreign policy advisor, people started approaching him. 
and often people with very attractive young women in arm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and um, in uh, one of the first was a guy named Joseph Mifsud, who was a an academic from Malta who actually headed the the uh, this London think tank where where Papadopoulos was working at the time. Uh, and Mifsud took him out to dinner, uh, flattered him, talked him up, etc., and uh, introduced him to an attractive young woman whom he billed as Vladimir Putin's niece. That's, that was untrue. Yeah. And then in late April, I uh, sat down with him over breakfast in London and told him that the Russians had, quote, dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of thousands of emails. Now, that essentially is the remark that got that sort of led to the launching of a formal investigation and kicked Russiagate up from, you know, from, from the, uh, the level of speculation and chatter into a major Watergate type, type scandal. Now, the press and, of course, uh, Mueller himself have not quite said this outright, but have hinted that Mifsud was some kind of Russian intelligence asset. I think but we he know. said that they believe that Papadopoulos believed he was. Well, yes, but in the Mueller report, they even went further. They said that he had extensive Russian contacts. Okay, yeah. But um, what we know is we know that the opposite is the case, that Mifsud was deeply tied to Western intelligence. His employer, a Swiss lawyer named uh, Rowe, R-O-H, Stefan Rowe, um, described him as deeply ensconced in the Western intelligence network. He taught a course for Italian uh, military uh, and police, police personnel. He co-taught this course with a high-ranking British intelligence official whose job was to vet the security credentials of top British officials, oh, so, yeah. so government officials. So if she taught, if she ta co-taught a course with Mifsud in Rome, then we can reasonable to assume that she had vetted uh, Mifsud as well. Mifsud, you know, took part in panel discussions, public panel discussions that were sponsored by the U.S. State Department. So it seems much likelier that he was tied to Western intelligence than he was to. Russian intelligence. And so therefore we have what appears to be a Western intelligence asset essentially being the prime mover. The guy who kicks uh, Russiagate up into high gear by passing along this tip to this naive young guy, uh, George Papadopoulos, uh, who then passes it along to an Australian diplomat who tells his government back home, who then tells the FBI, which then launches this formal investigation. So this whole thing seems to have been a concoction of the Western intelligence agencies. And this is not, this is not paranoia. This is not conspiracy mongering. This is really just, a, just an attempt to, to examine the bare facts in as clear and unprejudiced a manner as possible. Anyway, so go on. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry and for rambling on. No, no. These are, <laughs> these are important points. Um, and Mifsud... It's just kind of stunning, Dan, that Mueller would make these assertions when they're so easy to debunk. And in fact, there have been things published. I mean, even in like the BBC and other places, certainly in independent media, you know, showing Mifsud with pictures of Boris Johnson and other officials. And if he was, uh, you know, an agent of Russian intelligence, well, then he was apparently deeply embedded in Western intelligence and Western uh, foreign ministers and such. So it's just kind of stunning that they would use, and, and this is a basic premise, right? This is a core, without this, uh, you know, everything else kind of falls apart, right? Well, yes, and this is, this is the man, this is the, it was this, this, uh, this dirt, you know, uh, you know, thousands of emails comment, which essentially got the whole thing going. And, and this comment comes from the suit, an apparent Western intelligence asset. So, uh, but, you know, it doesn't stop there. In late May, a, a, a Russian emigre that calling himself Henry Greenberg, that's one of his aliases, a guy with a long criminal record, 
and uh, who has only been able to stay in the United States, remain in the United States by virtue of acting, serving as a longtime FBI informant. I mean, a guy who brags of helping the FBI, you know, prosecute any number of cases. He approaches um, Roger Stone, a, uh, a, a Trump uh, activist, supporter, uh, high, high conciliary in the Trump campaign, uh, and offers to to off, also offers to sell him dirt on Hillary Clinton for two million dollars, and Stone uh, turns him down because he smells a rat. And he says um, Trump would never pay for it. Yes, it does. actually, actually, what he says is even funnier. He says he says Trump never pays for anything. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, which is which? The people in the construction business know is true because Trump is notorious for for bilking his contract. Biffing people, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, so, uh, so, so he turned down, but but it seems quite reasonable to add to 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 ask whether the FBI sent this guy known as Greenberg to pose this question to Roger Stone, and this is before a formal investigation had been launched. This is even before George Papadopoulos' comments had reached FBI's, the FBI's ears. So it appears that the FBI was probing, 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 or, or other similar agencies were probing, probing, probing before launching a criminal investigation, clearly an attempt to generate the evidence that they needed to justify a criminal investigation. You know, it's a it's a it's a classic entrapment scheme where you know where uh, where I I get you to say you're a Russian agent and then I then I prosecute you as a Russian agent. And we also had Felix Sater in the mix here, and he something I didn't I didn't realize exactly what he had done, but he was apparently the the main driver behind the Trump Tower project, and he's got he's partnering with Cohen. And um, so they sort of had that line of that storyline going, too. And, and it turns out he's been an FBI informant since like 1998. Exactly right. Now, now we, and, and we have no idea whether he was still an active informant, of course. We don't know. Uh, right. he, and he may have lapsed. You know, who, who knows? But it's certainly a, a question worth worth asking. But it's a it's a it's a it's a tie that Mueller does not mention in his report, even though his top assistant Andrew Weissman was the uh, the prosecutor who inked the 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 deal with Sater back in 1998. So you know, um, yeah, I mean that the whole Weissman thing. I actually know Andrew Weissman a bit personally. I. I Spent, you know, I socialized with him a bit uh, 20 years ago uh, when he was a, a a recent graduate from Columbia Law School. Uh, he's he's known as a, a very aggressive guy, a uh, very aggressive prosecutor. He's really hard driving, uh, but you know, but Mueller is a is a tough, hard driving guy too. And this whole yeah. thing has this whole thing has Mueller's imprint too, because you know Mueller is a company man. Right. He's a he's a former head of the of the of the FBI. He's the guy who, in order to to buttress the FBI, um, you know, you know, did as he was told. He, he covered up Saudi involvement in 9/11 as the FBI director. He testified in Congress a few weeks before the invasion of Iraq that uh, that Saddam Hussein was bristling with WMDs that posed a direct threat to the United States. Uh, he, you know, he he completely botched a a a, a uh, a, well, he, he railroaded Muslims into jail using similar entrapment techniques. So he's a real he's a real company guy. And his, there's also his, the anthrax investigation, which was just a total train wreck. A total um, train wreck. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so he's a company guy who's who serves the in, who's, whose self perceived mission is to advance the interests of the FBI. So in this case, he sees I see. I think he saw his role as doing the same with regard to the intelligence community in general, which was buttressing their story of massive Russian penetration and, and, and interference, and then investigating the collusion question 
uh, and the obstruction question. But the most important thing is he did buttress the uh, the the intelligence community's claim of massive Russian interference, which is clearly not not you know based on facts. Right, and it seems like the 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 collusion conspiracy part of this report is cobbled together. I've seen some people asking questions about and and based on things they see like who they were interviewing early on in the when the special counsel was appointed it seemed like they were on the obstruction issue like immediately um and so there are some people questioning when did Mueller know that this conspiracy thing was never gonna was never gonna hold was really never gonna produce any charges and just wasn't justified and that you know was he really focused on obstruction the whole time and I think that's a reasonable question to ask well I think that um I I think he was pursuing conspiracy to the very end I mean that's why he uh, that's why he came down so hard on, on Paul Manafort I mean he had Paul Manafort uh in in solitary confinement for months uh in clearly an attempt to break him and to somehow make him testify to tell what he knew uh, about uh, the Trump campaign's outreach to Russia. And essentially, Manafort never broke because Manafort had nothing to say. There was no Trump outreach to Russia. In fact, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been bad mouthing Mueller, Mueller a lot, but let me just say his report is really quite good on the, on the uh, collusion issue. Uh, if, if you read it, he says over and over again, not only that there was no evidence to support collusion, but by as the as the controversy was rising for the summer of 2016, uh, Trump officials got were very wary of any Russian contacts at all. In fact, at, at a certain point, Kushner, his son-in-law, says, you know, he just was approached by some yet another Russian offering, you know, some kind of deal on on Hillary Clinton. And he says, uh, you know. He sends out an email saying, you know, watch out. There are a lot of these guys buzzing around. We don't know who they are. Um, and clearly, you know, you should stay away. Uh, so they were backing off uh, Russia really rapidly. That's probably why Roger Stone turned down Henry Greenberg. Because even by May, late May 2016, they were, they were wary of Russians coming to them you know, offering them, you know, uh, juicy tidbits about Hillary Clinton. Do you think that they were wary because they were afraid that, you know, Russians were going to cause trouble for their campaign? Or do you think that they were somehow aware that maybe there was entrapment type things going on? I think very possibly the latter. I mean, Roger Stone is a smart guy. I think he I think he knew what was going on. Uh, I think that they they were they were aware that the uh, the issue was getting very very hot and there were people trying trying to get them to say th- embarrassing things that could be used against Trump. So yeah, so I think it's I think it's reasonable to assume they knew they had an idea of what the uh, what the stakes were. I mean, by by midsummer, actually, really by by June of 2016, it was clear from the media that they were going to try to paint the Trump campaign as in league with the Russians. So at least from that point on, they, sh- they should have been cautious. But before that, I can't quite remember the context, like in the spring of 2016 or even earlier in 2015, if there were hints. Were there, do you remember, were there hints in the media? Were they already trying to cast suspicion about oh, this? Yes. Yes, they yes, were. Yes. Okay. Oh, definitely. Because, because they have to bear in mind, I mean, I mean, Political debate is so narrow in the United States, and the media is 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 are, are is so subservient to the government and the intelligence communities that the media saw nothing wrong with what the U.S. had done in Syria or Ukraine, even though its policies were heading for complete disaster. I mean, if Bashar al-Assad had fallen, then that would have meant that Al Qaeda and ISIS would have marched into the presidential palace. In Damascus, and you would have had an entire country under Al Qaeda, ISIS sway, a country very close to Europe. I mean, could you imagine any greater catastrophe? No, and I frankly can't. <laughs> you know, um, Cy Hirsch, I believe it was Cy Hirsch, said that 
the regime change part, the Syrian war, there's two segments to it, right? There's the anti-ISIS campaign in the east of Syria, and there's in the west of Syria, it was just regime change, a proxy war all the time. And Syher said this was Brennan's baby. So he, you know, very much cared about this. This was his thing. He didn't want to, uh, didn't want to fail. And it just, I've never understood what his plan was after, you know, the, the Assad government fell, what, what he intended to do. It was just it, never it, clear to me. It, well, it, cause it, it, was, it wasn't clear to you because it didn't make sense. You couldn't keep those two things separate. I mean, Al-Qaeda and ISIS were the, the two strongest elements in the anti-Assad forces. So the stronger they became, the more threatened Assad became. That's just, just plain as day. And if Assad had fallen, they would have been the, 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 chief, pow- the, the chief powers left standing. So I don't know the, who I, they thought was going to clean that up, you know? They had no idea. They were, their incompetence was, was, was amazing, just as their incompetence was, was astonishing in the Ukraine. Um, but, you know, but, uh, but, you know, I can't imagine any greater catastrophe than ISIS or al-Qaeda marching into the presidential palace in Damascus. And it's a catastrophe that Vladimir Putin prevented. And, and it, yet the, the only thanks he got from the U.S. was, was the deep fury of the, uh, of the Hillary Clinton faction in Washington. And I would argue that, I mean, if you take things in context, and I'm glad that you did bring in Ukraine and Syria um, as happening all at the same time as this campaign's happening, because I think it's important context. And I think, this is my opinion, I think that the uh, strategies, if you could call it a strategy, the tactics became more and more irrational as time went on because of the panic and the fury that you mentioned. I mean, that's the only, that's the only way I can explain what, you know, what we saw happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th- I think that I think that that I think that it was a, it's a crisis of imperialism. I mean, the, the U.S. the U.S. Uh, empire ex- had expanded so much following the collapse of the, the Soviets in, in uh, eighty nine to ninety two, um, and the expansion had been very successful, but it had gone on so long and was kind of petering out and running into trouble, and the this trouble caused panic and irrationality back in Washington. So, you know, the Ukraine operation was was completely bonkers. I mean, if the Ukraine operation had succeeded, it would have been an incredible coup for the United States because the U.S. would have, would have taken control of Sevastopol, right. um, Russia's uh, uh, most important naval base uh, on the Black Sea or really anywhere. Um, and Russia would essentially have been shut out of the entire Black Sea. And, uh, and, and, and that would have caused incredible strain along Russia's southern tier, its multi-ethnic, multinational um, uh, southern tier. And so therefore, you know, this big new Brzezinski's dream of actually breaking up Russia, he actually, in his, his book, The Grand Chessboard, he actually called for breaking up Russia into three parts. So his dream of breaking up Russia would have actually come significantly closer to fruition. But Putin just, you know, just nipped this in the bud by seizing Crimea. And that, and that uh, maneuver, which, which the U.S. should have expected, instead caught, caught it flat-footed and led to the deepest, most profound fury among Washington neocons. So they were, they were doubly flummoxed by, by Putin and, you know, and triply and quadruply angry at Russia, whom Clinton, whom Clinton actually described as the new Hitler. Uh, so the U.S. is really, its rhetoric was out of control, its ambitions were out of control, and its tactics were, were just irrational. They were so extreme and self-defeating that they, were, they, were, they wound up tripping over their own, own two feet. Yeah. And also at the same time, another thing that was just incredibly important to them was Aleppo. And right at this period of time, right in the, the months leading up to the election, uh, in September and October, Aleppo was falling. Yes. You know, so 
judging by the media reaction, it was just, it was of immense importance because they knew that, you know, once Aleppo fell, you know, it was a turning point in that war. The war was not over yet, but it was going to be over. So while I still have you, since we are a little bit past a half hour now, let's just go over if we could. Well, let me just let you, if you want to wrap up anything, I just want to address some of those 10 questions that you put out sure. in your latest article. But maybe you want to say a few things before we shift over to that. Yeah, I also wanted to add that you know that the the the, the U.S. intervention in in, uh, in Libya had also led to a, a catastrophe. Uh, Libya was reduced to anarchy, and then in 2015, all these wars in the Middle East came together and generated a major refugee crisis, uh, where you know where where thousands and thousands of refugees were flying were were fighting to flee the chaos. That, that U.S. policies had really created in the in the in the Muslim world, fighting to make their way to Europe, which, as we know, led to to huge political ramifications, a complete discrediting of the liberal center, uh, the rise of radical right xenophobic parties. So U.S. policies were were really leading to a to a widespread disaster. Yet the U.S. did not respond by, by, by rethinking, by reconsidering where it was going, by thinking, so by sitting down and saying, like, oh, gee, maybe we made a mistake. They didn't do that. Instead, they doubled down uh, by, 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 you know, by stepping up their anti-Russian, anti-Putin rhetoric to the point where when a critic of their policy seemed to be you know, advancing on the campaign trail, they launched a hue and cry against him as a Russian agent. Yeah, and it and was the, driving a wedge between Europe and the United States as well. Right. And the intelligence community just you know, pitched in, and the press pitched in as well. And the result was we had a super war, Watergate, which, which, which dominated headlines for really three years, and which the Democrats are still trying to, to keep on going through ever more desperate means. Yeah, you know, this, this speaking of Watergate, I mean, that just fascinates me. There's this Watergate tug of war going on, right? The Democrats, I noticed from early on, the New York Times had set forth the Watergate narrative. Um, CNN brought uh, Bernstein into this, and he became one of the main commentators on all the time. And they were, uh, they were convinced that they were going to be able to craft this into a Watergate against Trump. But the truth of the matter, it appears, is that it, it, it is, as you call it, a mega Watergate, but you have to flip it on its head. It's the other way around. It's a Watergate, um, you know, waged against Trump. Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, remember, the original Watergate was, was, was very simple. You had these, these White House employees were discovered caught in the act of, bur of burglary. Burgling, burgling the uh, the Democratic uh, headquarters in Washington D.C. So they, they they arrested these five burglars. They turned out to be working in the White House. They had an office in the White House. So the the task of Watergate was simply to find a connection between the the White House basement and the Oval Office. And of course, there was obviously a connection. So you know, so so it was, it was a very simple affair. But here there was no breaking. We still have have you know, it's not clear what the Russian intervention was. Uh, uh, it, the whole incident is very murky. Uh, it, it apparently was not a break-in, or maybe it was a break-in. Maybe there were some, maybe Russian intelligence agencies were rummaging around in the in the DNC computers. Yeah, probably. Uh, but probably a lot of people were. They think the DN, DNC security was so bad. But um, but there was nothing like a break-in, like an actual burglary, and people were not caught in the act, and so therefore it was based on the purest speculation um, and speculation, of course, which began before the, uh, the, the, the computer break-in was discovered. That's the important part. I mean, yes. they, they, I mean the, uh, Joseph Mifsud was approaching uh, George Papadopoulos before uh, the DNC had announced that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, its computers had been hacked by the Russians. So yeah. to compare it to, to, to Watergate is putting the, the cart before the horse. And as you're right, of course, this is really much more of a Watergate directed against the, uh, against the Trump campaign. 
But you can't go a day without hearing someone in the media or some political ac uh, activist, you know, talking about Watergate. The latest thing, latest parallel they're drawing is that they think Don McGahn's going to be their John Dean, I think. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> It's so, it's, it's so exhausting. It's so tiresome. It, is. it just, go, it it just is goes on and on, and, and they're just grasping at straws. It I'm, is exhausting, and I just, I just want to like walk away from it. But unfortunately, it's, it's like a train. You know, I, it's like a car wreck. Because I can't take my eyes away from it. Precisely. And, you know, and Mitch McConnell's, you know, Mitch McConnell is a, a detestable human being yeah. by any standard. But nonetheless, his speech, his case closed speech yesterday, was devastating. Just devastating. Yeah, uh, I saw and, some Nancy Pelosi <laughs> response to that, which was like, I don't think so. Case right. closed. I don't think so. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so I mean, I, I mean, I see Russiagate as a giant conspiracy to reelect Trump, <laughs> 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 to ratchet up tensions with Russia to ever more dangerous levels, and to persecute Julian Assange. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other aspect of it. Um, and, you know, that's that's a good segue into your article. You say there are 10 questions that the report should answer but doesn't. And my, I'm not sure if it's in here, but one of my big questions is, why didn't you interview Julian Assange? That's absolutely correct. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, why didn't you, know, you know, why didn't they interview Julian Assange? There are a lot of people they should have spoke to. They didn't, they didn't speak to, uh, to Christopher Steele. Yeah, what the the, uh, the the author of the uh, of the steel uh, the famous steel dossier, the Golden Showers uh, dossier, which uh, which was the the the, sing, the document that you know is the single single most important document in terms of driving this whole thing. Uh, yeah, and the reason was that they they didn't want to they didn't want to find out certain things. That's why. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They want, just... they, want to, they want to find out some things, but not other things. I listened to um, I've been following Andy McCarthy's work on this too who um i probably don't agree with him on anything in this entire world except some of his analysis on russiagate and um last night he said on john bachelor's show you know they said why didn't you know how come they couldn't find mifsud and mccarthy said well it looks like they didn't want to find mifsud yeah you know i mean the uh, this is the the, the the great irony about about russiagate of course is that uh uh, for myself, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a leftist, I'm a socialist, a Marxist. Uh, so if, therefore, I find myself reading these people like Andrew McCarthy. Yeah. McCarthy is a, is a, uh, writes the National Review. He's a right winger, uh, vehemently anti-Russian, et cetera, et cetera. But I find myself nodding my head in the grin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when, I, when I read this guy, it's, it's, it's very strange. And, and others, other conservative writers as well. They, I mean, they, they, are, they are smart enough to see a a huge flaw in the Russiagate ar argument and to, and to pounce on it and to tear at it like, you know, like, like terriers. And, they're, and they're, they've been very good. Uh, so, you know, McCarthy's writing has been excellent on this question. And the, the arrogance of the, the pro-Russiagate uh, conspirators, I will call them, you know, the fact that this is such a flawed case and yet they have so much power over certain aspects of the state apparatus, even still, and the media. And yeah. they believe that they can just overwhelm the fact. They can just crush it with their, their power. Yeah, you know, the other funny thing is that the, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm old enough, unfortunately, to remember the, uh, all the, um, the JFK conspiracy buffs. And uh, you probably know, you know, for, for literally decades, people were running around with all kinds of spins on the on the JFK investigation, a JFK assassination, and and they were so inventive and so clever that it was hard not to be drawn into their web. But I was always very skeptical. I really, to this day, I believe in the lone gunman theory. I believe that Oswald did it. Uh, there was no conspiracy. There was no parallax view, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in, what we see with Russiagate is this kind of runaway conspiratorialism invading the mainstream. So that so so the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, Rachel Maddow, the intelligence agencies, et cetera, are all become party to this rampant conspiratorialist paranoia where <laughs> there are Russian agents, you know, you know lurking behind every bush 
I mean, if you remember, at one point Hillary Clinton actually put out a report that uh, that that uh, that Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, had a secret communications wire from the oh, Trump yeah. Tower into the Kremlin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it, you know, this is just this is crazy stuff. But the it, press, they seem the to have adopted it as a ta- you know, consciously adopted it as a tactic. I don't really know. I'm not really. I think that they were really were captured by their own fantasies. Yeah, maybe. I I, I think they were sincere in a certain way. Um, that's my psychological analysis. But but uh, it, it it was the strangest damn thing. And and the Russiagate Russia gate critics are simply critics trying to to puncture this huge bubble by pointing out that the facts just don't fit. Yeah, exactly. So let's move on to your 10 questions. Maybe we could just pick one or two of them that you think are most interesting. Okay, well, I think the most, I would argue the most important question deals with the scope of Russian interference. So essentially, um, Mueller um, essentially picked up where the intelligence agencies left off. Uh, If you recall, in January 2017, they put out a, a report in which they alleged there was widespread Russian uh, interference. They presented no evidence whatsoever. And they included in it a, a seven-page diversion, uh, you know, uh, essentially tirade against Russia Today, RT, the uh, the, the state news agencies that, yeah. that, that Russia has put together, which is, you know, which whatever you think of it actually does, does a very good job in, in many ways, but it's just a news agency. Yeah, they... They have a certain slant, as the BBC or Voice of America has a certain slant as well. But that's all they do. They otherwise, they're not an intelligence agency. But the the report, the ICA report, um, essentially painted them as a hostile intelligence source, and it just sort of showed how paranoid and angry and um, and really uh, um, unperceptive the intelligence agencies had become. But Mueller used that as a starting point. He essentially implicitly endorsed those findings. But we know actually that that the Russian penetration was really very small scale. There's a, this company in St. Petersburg called the Internet Research Agency, which is headed by uh, a guy who was known as a, he was a contractor, was known as Putin's chef because yeah. he ran, ran restaurants that Putin had dined in a few times and got some government contracts uh, involving food purveying. Uh, but anyway, we, we have no idea what his relationship with, the, um, with the, the, the Kremlin actually is, but he took it upon himself to do some trolling starting in 2014, actually, before, uh, before Trump was even on the, on the radar screen. And they, 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 they ran some, some pictures, you know, some, 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 took out some ads on Facebook, uh, eventually sort of, you know, making a uh, posting anti-Hillary, pro-Trump stuff. Stuff seemed to be aiming at sowing discord, as the, use the famous phrase, in the United States. But it was extremely small scale, extremely small scale. Uh, they spent $100,000 in all, for example. Um, and only 46,000 of that prior to Election Day. And the, whereas the Trump and, uh, and, um, and Clinton campaigns spent a total of uh, over $80 million on uh, social media advertisements. So their, their, their efforts were extremely um, small. Uh, they, the, the ads they placed were just sort of strange. You know, there, was, there was a famous cartoon of Bernie Sanders as a muscle-bound guy in a Speedo. Oh, Buff yeah. Bernie. So, so that somehow is supposed to generate support for Bernie Sanders. Another, another famous photo of, of, a, of Jesus arm wrestling Satan, who is, <laughs> of course, is, is pro Hillary. You know, and that's supposed, that's supposed to, like, you know, to persuade, you know, somehow get inside Americans' brains and, and convince them to vote for a vote well, against well, Hillary Clinton. But it was also one of those ones that's retweet for yes and, you know, or re- retweet for Jesus and like for, you know. <laughs> So it's really just to generate um, activity and clicks and influence. So it appears the influence but, of the account that posted that tweet. You know, right? But so, so the IRA may have made as many as eighty thousand posts over a two and a half year period, which actually 
only two years of which actually coincided with the, the presidential campaign, and that those 80,000 posts may have reached 126 million people. So that means that 126 million people may have seen one of those posts over a two and a half year period. However, the average Facebook user gets 220 such posts or ads per day, 90% of which he disregards, he or she disregards, 95% of which. Yeah, I scroll right through this. Right. <laughs> and, and the total the total number of posts and ads and posts and ads totaled thirty three trillion. So what are eighty three what are eighty thousand posts compared to thirty three trillion? In it other words, dual. nothing. Yeah. Right? Uh, um, IRA might have, may have had thirty eight hundred Twitter accounts, which may have uh, posted. 176,000 tweets during the 10-week presidential campaign. But Twitter says there were 1 billion election-related tweets. So what are 176,000 tweets versus 1 billion tweets? Again, a drop in the bucket. So the Mueller campaign doesn't discuss this. Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, come, doesn't try to put the numbers in perspective. It doesn't try to make an argument that, you know, as you know, concern is not try to like, you know, present evidence concerning how how extensive and important this intervention was. It throws out a few big numbers and that's it. That's all it says. And I think that's actually is dishonest, intellectually dishonest. The report also admits that even of the 176,000 IRA tweets, only 8.4 percent were election related. So, so what were the other ninety-one point six percent about? <laughs> um, but the price of strawberries. Uh, I mean, and the um, and and when they they talk about uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of IRA, his contacts with the Kremlin, the only evidence they're able to come up with is a single New York Times article, you know, <laughs> which they which is probably based on leaks from the FBI or the yeah, or the, or the, CI, yeah. or the CIA. Uh, you know, so so, what does that what does that mean? Uh, they, 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 to me, I'm I'm still astonished by the fact that the that the the FBI never physically inspected the DNC computers or servers. That to me is astonishing. So how do we know? Therefore, how does the, the how does Mueller's team know? Therefore, that the uh, the GRU was was rummaging around in those computers and servers. And does it have other sources they haven't tell, aren't telling us about? There's a very good chance there are other sources, i.e. the NSA, but National Security uh, Agency. But the, the report is, uh, is still silent on that. And it's, as I said before, it's also deeply misleading on the question of Joseph Mifsud. It just is, presents a very, very one-sided picture that if I was, no, if I was a, a reporter, you know, handing in this report to my editor, my editor would haul me on the carpet and say, you've got to be objective. You've got to tell both sides. And, and this, the, the Mueller report does not do. It's a very, it's a one-sided brief, which is aimed at shoring up these really, all these scary tales about massive Russian interference, which really aren't, aren't true. Right. And, you know, for people who haven't dug into the details of this, there we could we could go on and on about this. For example, with the IRA, the the St. Petersburg troll farm, you know, the Mueller, first of all, the whenever they brought indictments, they seemed oddly timed uh, for the the court of public opinion, for one. But when Mueller brought indictments against this, you know, all Russian uh, St. Petersburg troll farm, they never expected that case to ever come to court. And yet, since they indicted a company, uh, that company, you know, hired a lawyer over here in the United States and showed up at the court and said, okay, you know, it's on. So they wanted to actually challenge the case, at which point the Mueller team panicked. They're like, oh, oh, oh we're not ready. We, we need a, we need some time. We need a delay, which just kind of really did not look good for them at all. And as, then as, they refused, you know, when it came time for disclosure, they didn't want to disclose anything. So they were absolutely not prepared to actually try this case, even though they brought the indictments. 
And I would think that a judge would, uh, you know, really not look well upon that. I mean, they, as Andrew McCarthy pointed out, they, um, one of the reasons they sort of sought a delay was that they said that the, um, the company, Concord Management, I think it's called, had not been properly served, but, but there was Concord Management <laughs> in the courtroom. There they are, yeah. Asking, demanding to be heard. So uh, it just it made no sense. I mean, plainly, plainly, uh, the Mueller team was caught off guard. It didn't. It didn't expect that it that it would have to defend its, defend its d- indictment in a court of law, and the and the and the indictment some months later of the GRU Russian military intelligence uh, was also one of these press release indictments, which the Mueller team also never expects. To have to defend in a court of law, uh, and if you read that indictment, that that indictment also essentially indicts uh, WikiLeaks uh, by describing how the GRU, via this this persona Gucci, uh, Guccifer 2.0, relayed the, the the data it stole from the DNC to WikiLeaks. But if you look at the sequence that the indictment outlines, and which the Mueller report uh, then you know reiterates months later it doesn't make sense it's all wrong yeah the, the the narrative just doesn't really quite add up because it has julian assange announcing that a big leak is on the way and then guccifer 2.0 only subsequently reaching out to wikileaks and then some emails are exchanged where it's not clear what what guccifer is offering then Guccifer finally turns over a, an encrypted one gigabyte file, which WikiLeaks then opens up four days later. And then four days after that releases this huge, huge cache of DNC emails. But clearly that huge cache can't be what Guccifer relayed to them four days earlier because they would, they would not give enough time to vet the material to make sure that it was not tampered with that it was, you know, it was genuine, et cetera. I mean, they, they were, we're talking about 28,000 emails and, and files that, that, uh, that WikiLeaks released in July 2016, which created turmoil, political turmoil. So, you know, and, and WikiLeaks, it's, its calling card is its accuracy and its honesty. I mean, people only believe it if the material it puts out is true. Um, and so four days, it doesn't make sense that WikiLeaks would go public with a a file that Guccifer had only transferred to it eight days earlier and which it had only opened four days earlier. But that yeah. is essentially the, the nub of the of Mueller's case against WikiLeaks. And it just doesn't stand up. Just that just doesn't make sense on on the bare face of it. Right. And for other reasons it, it doesn't too. But I, I think maybe a good way to wrap this up is by saying that Despite all these flaws that we've touched on here, and as I, I mentioned, you know, we could each one of these things has, um, all, you know, a whole bunch of threads that you can pull on that are interesting threads. But despite this, you know, severely flawed case, what we're seeing now is people are in most most people are letting go of the whole collusion narrative. But there's one thing that in a bipartisan fashion there's almost like a feverish need to salvage one thing out of Russiagate, and that is that Russia interfered in our elections, even though neither Dan nor I thinks that there's enough proof here to, to ever prove that. But everyone seems to agree that we're going to hold on to that one. And, you know, there's all kinds of talk about protecting our elections and, you know, it's being used to... I believe it's going to be used to say, well, the FBI and the CIA were justified in infiltrating the campaign and running the, all these spy operations because the Russians did interfere in our elections and they were, you know, trying to do damage to our democracy. And they're holding on to that for dear life. What do you think is going on there? Well, I think the Democrats are holding on, on to that for dear life. I think, I think first – there is a consensus across the board that Russia did it with, uh, with help from WikiLeaks. So therefore, the hostility against both those, those entities is just overwhelming at this point. But number two, there is, you know, Barr has now launched an investigation into how this whole thing got started. 
And that is going to be dynamite because that is going to ignite a second civil war in Washington uh, where the Democrats will say that uh, it's, it's an attempt to to pillory the FBI and CIA merely for doing their job, whereas Trump will argue, uh, it's, assuming that Barr comes up with what, what, I, what I think he'll come up with, that the, uh, the intelligence community was out of control. Uh, that it was massively interfering the, in the election in order to uh, promote um, Hillary's candidacy. And, you know, and just bear in mind what's at stake here. I mean, what, what Trump is alleging, and it's, there's a good, it, it's, 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 it's not unpersuasive, is that there was a, a massive effort by these, these agencies, you know, with the collaboration of the, of the major corporate media, to essentially fix the elections. And, and, and after Trump was elected, then to destabilize and paralyze his administration yeah. so that essentially the, the, the ongoing confrontation with Russia would not only continue, but intensify. Uh, so what we're talking about here is about a, a kind of a deep state uh, quasi coup. And, and, I, and I know this sounds paranoid. I know this sounds conspiratorialist, and I really don't want it to be, because I think that the, the bare facts suggest that that is something that that was what was really going on. As as Freud said, even paranoids have enemies, and even <laughs> anti even anti conspir conspiratorialists, you know, must recognize that sometimes conspiracies do take place. Uh, and so, in this case, you, you have the intelligence community and the press and the Democrats in general mounting this huge effort to stop Trump, number one, and then number two, to stop him from uh, putting U.S.-Russian relations on a new footing. Uh, and, and that, to me, is a, is a sign of the incredible breakdown in, a, in constitutional relations in Washington. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, I noticed you wrote an article about that, too. I'd like to maybe at another time um, talk to you about that, but this seems to be the one card in this house of cards that cannot fall. Um, and there does seem to be consensus that, you know, we can't let go of this one. Although Trump, although he seems to be going along with it, he's still got this, you know, he's really pissed off about what happened and he's still, you know, forwarding the narrative that they were out of control and it was a witch hunt. And I don't see him letting go of that, even though he'll say, yeah, but yeah, Russia interfered in our election. He'll concede that, but he's holding on to, and he's out on the stump speech going on and on and on about the witch hunt. And he's now got even more ammunition. Yeah. And I think it's, I, I think it'll, it'll work for him on the campaign trail because I think it's, it's plausible. I mean, it, 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 it makes sense to, to voters. It seems to be true. Uh, and I think that the, uh, it'll place the Democrats at a huge disadvantage. I mean, even even you know Sanders was a paid lip service to this whole this whole Russia mess. Yeah. So uh, so I think uh, yeah I think it's I think it's I think Trump realizes that this is, this is he's got a winning card here, and he wants to play it for all it, all it's worth. And uh, Trump is uh, Trump is very good on the campaign trail, very very good. Yeah, just uh, there's some vengeance there. Like this whole thing's <laughs> full of vengeance. Anyway, um, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And please let people know uh, where to find your work and how to support your work. Okay, well, I have a, uh, I, I write a lot for a, a website called Consortium News. I also have my own blog called DanielLazar.com, uh, which deals with uh, constitutional matters uh, primarily. Uh, and I've written a few books, the best known of which is a book that came out in, in 1996 called The Frozen Republic, uh, How the Constitution is Paralyzing Democracy, which was uh, a book which asks all those questions about that, uh, that 220-year-old document uh, that, are, that, that, that you aren't supposed to ask, uh, and, uh, which, but which to me beg to be asked. And once you ask them, it leads you, leads you to some very uncomfortable uh, conclusions about what the United States is, uh, how it works, and where it's going. Excellent. Well, thank you again, and um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to Daniel Lazar. Follow Dan on Twitter at DH Lazar, D H L A Z A R E. Find his work at Consortium News 
Find his writings and his books at daniellazar.com. Around the Empire, listener-supported independent media. Pitch in if you can. Patreon.com slash Around the Empire. PayPal.me slash Around the Empire Pod. Special thanks to longtime patrons and to new patrons and contributors to everyone who sends messages, emails with suggestions and feedback. I appreciate it a lot, and you really do make a difference. The audio podcast has been the main focus of Around the Empire, where the most traffic is. There are many ways to listen to it. Find it, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, listen to it on the website aroundtheempire.com, or on patreon.com slash aroundtheempire, or on YouTube, youtube.com slash aroundtheempire. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, hit the thumbs up to like the video, leave me a comment, don't forget to subscribe. I'm still working on a new look, new kinds of content, including video content, some other things that I think you'll find interesting. Help me out by beefing up those subscriber levels on the YouTube channel. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.